Good morning. <laughs> it's um, morning. really my pleasure to launch today's session with um, Trey Maddox and Katie Oden. And this is Primetime in the Library. Um, the mission of this Primetime series is to encourage lifelong learning beyond the classroom for faculty, students, and staff. So it's always fun to see a mix of students, faculty, and staff at these. Um, and these Primetime sessions are collaborations between the library and many offices on campus. Today, the presentation is a collaboration with the Academic Affairs Office because we have Edgren Scholars with us today. Um, Trey and Katie Caitlin received an Edgren Scholars Award for research that was done last summer, and that's what they're going to tell you about today. Um, and I love the fact that it's named the Edgren Scholars Award. It's named after the founder of Bethel, um, who was very interested in the relationship between faculty and students. And when he talked about educational principles and founding Bethel, one of the four key principles was um, focused on the relationship between faculty and students. And so I think he would be very pleased to see this program that really um, has the primary goal of looking at research and scholarship in the context of students and faculty working together. So we'll have the treat to hear um, Trey Maddox, um, Assistant Professor of Chemistry, who's been here since 2007, and Caitlin present their research this morning. Um, I also want to announce that next Thursday, um, the Research Prize, the 2011 Library Research Prize will be awarded, um, and the Traveling Trophy, which is actually, if you haven't seen it, it's the wonderful clear skull over there, um, will be awarded to the next department, Carol Craig will hold that up for us, um, which is really a wonderful initiative that the library is doing, um, a scholarship for student research. So we'll go to the department. history department has had that now for a little bit of time. It'll go to the department of the student who wins the award for this year. Um, so Trey and Caitlin, we'd love to hear from you this morning. All right, well, uh, first just let me say, like, thank you for, uh, for being here and just listening to this talk. Um, it was a, a privilege to be an Ed Edgren Scholar this uh, last summer. It was a lot of fun working with Caitlin and just uh, seeing her growth as a researcher and just being able to kind of move forward in one of the, one of the projects that I have a lot of interest in. And so um, just to kind of give you guys a brief um, overview of what we're going to do, um, I'm going to kind of take the, the boring half of this and I'm going to give you some of the background and kind of where this, where this project came from and kind of how we came up with the idea of researching in this area. And then I'm going to let Caitlin tell you about the summer that, the, the research that we actually did this summer um, and kind of the progress that we've made so far. Um, so the title of the talk is Template Directed Synthesis for the Regulation of Gene Expression. And um, really where we're at at this point is just the template directed synthesis, the regulation of gene expression, we'll talk about in a second, is really kind of the, the hope, the pipe dream of this, uh, of this research. And um, so to kind of give you an idea of where this research started, um, one of the things that, that I really enjoy and the people that I have worked for have really enjoyed doing is, let's take a look at what nature has already figured out, okay? There's a lot of systems that nature has already uh, worked out of many of the details and some of these systems are extremely complex and extremely ingenious um, and probably one of the ones that has interested me the most is actually working in the area of DNA and DNA replication and so what I have up here is just a, a very general schematic of the central dogma if you will of, of biology this idea that um, that DNA can not only replicate itself it can be transcribed and ultimately translated into proteins and, and this central dogma of biology is really what makes every living cell that we have out there work. Um, but what was really interesting for me, coming from a chemist's standpoint, is that buried inside of this um, is an idea. It's something that's only done in the central dogma of biology, in this replication and translation and transcription of DNA. And this is the idea of using a template to actually pass along information. Okay, so the way DNA works is that it can actually use one half of its strand to serve as a template for the production of an identical um, species. Okay, and so we can pass on genetic information and this is how we do that. But what we wanted to understand, the, the question that we wanted to have is, can we now as a, as a chemist, can we take a look at this system, this, um, this methodology, let's say, that biology has already worked out and can we actually understand fundamentally how it works and then ultimately what we always like to do is we like to play with them okay so can we manipulate this system and can we control this system now 
one of the things that makes this system difficult to control is that it already has a huge number of regulating bodies on it, okay? So this system in biology is heavily controlled by enzymes. And because of this, the number of inputs into this and the output is very limited, okay? It has to be in order to protect our genetic information, okay? It has to be controlled. But if we want to use this idea and then be able to broaden its scope and be able to understand it in a bigger way, we needed to figure out, can we use this idea, this template-directed polymerization, but can we remove some of the regulation? And so, can we do this in the absence of enzymes? And that was really the question that started this research. Can we do this template-directed polymerization and really remove the enzymes from the picture, all right? And so in order to do that, we needed to boil down this DNA replication to its most fundamental states. And what we were able to do is come down to that, the, when you strip away the enzymes, what we really need to have is we need to have this two-step process. And the first one is kind of represented up here. It's basically a reversible thermodynamically controlled process where the actual base pairing that occurs between the monomers and the template drive whether this reaction will occur or not. Okay, and we get this product. Now this product, like I said, is reversible. It can go back and forth. So if this base pairing is incorrect, this process won't move forward. Okay, so we can control what's coming in. This is how our DNA controls, making sure that we, we have the right base pairing. And then ultimately, once we have this thermodynamic step taken care of, if this works, then what we have is a second step that traps this product. Okay? And then it moves forward and DNA continues to replicate itself in this fashion. So the question that we have, and I'm sorry, which is my computer's over there and then I can talk and I'm standing right in front of everybody. So, um, so what we were basically able to do was to take this, this very large idea and boil it down to what we thought would be the two fundamental ideas, that if we could control these and we could mimic these, we could potentially design a system that could replicate this, or at least uh, the word that we use a lot is, is to mimic this system. And so what we came up with was the idea was to use a, a reaction that we see in organic chemistry a lot, which is the interaction of a carbonyl and, a, and an amine, a primary amine in this case. And when these two are brought together under thermodynamic control, you have this equilibrium between the um, aldehyde and this amine forming what we know as an aminium ion. Okay, and so what we're hoping is that this step can be the, the mimic, if you will, for that first th thermodynamic step that we see in DNA. And so what we're hoping is that if we were to translate this into DNA, that if we could make a monomer that had an aldehyde and amine, and then put these amine and this aldehyde on the, the normal DNA scaffolding, if this base pairing can work, then what we can actually do is form this same aminium ion, but now between this growing polymer. And then in the presence of a reducing agent, which happens to be one of our uh, metal hydrides, um, we can actually do that last step, which is to trap this. And so in the presence of sodium cyanoborohydride, which is what this is, this is basically just a trapping agent, if you will. And so what this is going to do is it's going to change this aminium to an amine. Okay, and now what we've done is we've taken a system that here is under thermodynamic control where this base pairing is extremely important and then we've turned it into something that's trapped. It can't go forward. It can't come apart. Okay, so this is a very, very stable linkage whereas this is an unstable linkage that's dependent on this base pairing being correct. Okay, so this was the idea. This is what we hoped we would be able to do. Um, now, what this is going to do is if you translate this all the way forward, what we now have is if this is basically our standard um, DNA base, DNA sugar, but what we've done is we've changed out the normal phosphodiester backbone for what is now an amine backbone. And so here's the, I guess, basically the, the joy of actually being far down the road. Um, I can actually tell this story and put these two ideas together where they actually happen far apart in time, but at this point, what we want to do is we want to ask a question, and I want to throw this out there so that you guys can understand maybe potentially where we're going and where this title came from, which was gene regulation. Because now what we have is we have a very interesting molecule. We have basically DNA with an alternate backbone. And the question is, um, first of all, is that alternate backbone a suitable replication of the phosphodiester backbone? 
And so I'll very briefly talk through this. Basically what we did is we made some short DNA trimers and we modified the ends of them. So one of them we modified with an amine, one of them we modified with an aldehyde. And the one thing I want to make sure to point out is that if this template is not present, this reaction does not happen. So um, the important thing to note is that the template is extremely important for this reaction to happen. Because we don't want this reaction to happen out in solution where we have no control over it. We have control over it if it's on the template. And so in the presence of the template, we can get these two trimers to bind. We find a, a favorable equilibrium constant for the formation of the imine. And just to kind of briefly cover what, what's going on here, what this is showing us is that um, this is a highly favorable equilibrium constant saying that this in the duplex form is actually the more stable form, which is what we want. We want this to be stable on the, on the template in the duplex form. And so what we see is that this aminium ion is actually a really good replicator of the phosphodiester linkage. Now, the very nice thing that we found when we did this is that when we actually do the reduction and we turn the imine into an amine, we actually see a very drastic drop in that equilibrium constant. And so now what we find is a process that here was more favorable to be on this side. Once we've reduced it to the amine, it's much less favorable. So we've dropped by an order of 10 to the 6th as far as this equilibrium constant. And so what this allows us to find out is that upon reduction of the binding affinity, so this is basically what we can define as the binding affinity between these two pieces. When this drops, this allows us to use the template catalytically. So what we can do is we can throw template in, form the imine, have it reduce, and because this binding affinity drops so significantly, these two pieces, a significant amount of them actually come apart, and this template can pass back into the cycle and now we can use it catalytically, okay? So, so we knew we had a, 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 at least something that could potentially mimic this phosphodiester linkage. Now, like I said before, let's ask the question, what could this potentially be used for? And I talked about the fact that we could do potentially some gene silencing with this. Um, and this is kind of the, the main target that we're shooting for. Um, so I'm gonna kind of fast forward through here a little bit. Um, RNA interference. Now, we, we looked at the very first slide. We know this kind of central dogma of biology exists. So this is chromosomal DNA. It's transcribed into a messenger RNA. The messenger RNA is then read by a ribosome and translated into a protein. Okay, the proteins are the machinery of your cells. They're doing all of the hard work, the heavy lifting, if you will. Now, if we wanted to, let's say this protein is something we don't want expressed. Let's say it's a disease state. Um, and we wanted to actually stop the production of this protein. Well, we have two options. We can either stop it here at the transcription, or we can stop it at the translation. Now, where we think ours has the most potential is actually to stop it here, at the translation stage. Because ribosomal, uh, the ribosomes only will bind to single-stranded mRNA. But what we think is that, or what we're hoping, is that our modified DNA will actually serve to bind the messenger RNA and prevent these ribosomes from actually binding to the messenger RNA and translating them into the proteins. Now, this idea of RNA interference, and basically this is a, this is a very broad definition. I'm using this in the, very, the broadest definition of RNA interference. Basically, we're trying to stop the translation of our messenger RNA. And there's a lot of methods that are out there for trying to do this. And most of them actually use native DNA. And in all of those methods, there's a couple of problems. And the first one is cell permeability. How do you get these guys into the cell if they're going to do this work? And so the problem here is that DNA is negatively charged. The surface of the cell is negatively charged. It's kind of the idea of trying to put two magnets together if you've got them facing the wrong direction, right? They repel each other. They don't want to get in here. Now, I don't want to shortchange this. There are a lot of researchers that have done a lot of work in trying to figure out how to get this into the cells. But we think we have a unique way around it. So if this is the problem, here's our solution, is the fact that when we actually change the backbone to an amine group, under physiological conditions, ours is positively charged. So we've completely changed the backbone. And now there's been a, a lot of research done that proteins actually have used this method for a long, long time. And that is what they will do is they will tag the end of their protein with these heavily positively charged sequences. And they're really not sure what the total mechanism for this is, but these heavily charged sequences at the end of proteins, when they come in contact with the cell, either by a passive or an active mechanism, will just get taken up. The cell just takes them up readily. And so what we're hoping 
is that we can uh, basically piggyback on this idea and that by putting the positive charge in our backbone, we can actually get these guys into the cell using this either passive or active mechanism that already exists in the cells. Now the next thing is, is that once you get them in the cell, you need them to have some type of intercellular lifetime. Now the, the cell has a lot of defensive mechanisms against this. There are a number of uh, diseases, viruses, other bacteria that try to hijack the cell system by inserting foreign DNA. And so the cell already has a lot of defenses in there that will chew up DNA, these DNases, that, DNases and RNAs that exist in the cell, um, in the cytoplasm of the cell. But here again, our unique backbone has a unique solution in that these enzymes, because they are so specific, hopefully will not recognize our backbone. They don't have the mechanism to cleave our backbone. So hopefully, there's no direct mechanism for the degradation of this product once it gets into the cell. There are passive ways, there are ways, but hopefully this will give it a long enough cellular lifetime to actually do what we want it to do. Now the next thing is we need to actually bind to our targets. Now, what we have actually seen, and I'll describe to you in a second, we've actually made a few of these guys. Um, and what we find is that when we get up to 16 units long, so 16 monomers linked together, we actually get melting temperatures. And what the melting temperature is, is if you get this new, what we call an ANP, so it's a mean link nuclear poly polymers, when we get those linked to DNA, what we can do is we can measure the melting temperature. And the melting temperature is when these guys come apart, okay? And what we have actually found is when we get up to 16 units long, we get melting temperatures that are in excess of 80 to 90 degrees, okay? Which is extremely high. We're talking the boiling point of water now, okay? So these binding affinities are extremely high. And so what this will do, or what we're hoping now, is that we've got at least a potential answer for getting ours into the cell. We have a potential answer for having it have a, a, a significant lifetime in the cell and for actually binding to its target, preventing the ribosome from binding and pre preventing it from being translated. Now, the only thing that we don't have solved is the, or at least have a potential explanation for is cellular trafficking. How do we get it into the right place? Um, and this may just be a concentration. We just have to get the concentration high enough to get it into the right place. But at this point, there are methodologies for doing this, but our, what we're going to talk about today doesn't directly address those. So of the four main problems for doing RNA interference, we think that this unique backbone has the potential for at least answering three of those. Now, in order to do this, we've got to make a couple of monomers, okay? So we're going to do template-directed polymerization. We're going to use a DNA template to make a copy of itself, but we're going to do that without enzymes, and we're going to use this new, what we what is actually termed as reductive amination, where we form this aminium ion and then trap it. We need to make some modifications, and so I'm not going to talk too much about this because Caitlin's actually going to hit most of this. Um, talking about these actual monomers. But these are the four guys that we're after. The main changes you'll notice are at the five prime position and the three prime position. What used to be alcohol groups are now an amine and an acid aldehyde, okay? So these are the, the targets that we're after, and this is actually the research that we're working on. Now, to back up, some of this research has already been done. We've worked on this a little bit. We were actually successful in the past in actually synthesizing the thymidine monomer. This was by an older synthetic route, which Caitlin will talk about in a little bit, why we're not using that synthetic route anymore. But at the end of the day, we are able to make these not only as monomers, but also as dimers. Now, very quickly, the reason that we have these dimers is you actually notice that there's a different linkage between these. This is an amide linkage. One of the things I told you is that we need this positive charge, hopefully, to get it into the cell. Well, one of the things that has been found in that research is it's not only the positive charge, but the distribution of that charge. And what this allows us to do is to insert some neutral linkages if we need to spread this charge out a little bit or if we need to make it more condensed. So by, in, by putting this amide linkage in, now we can link some of these guys together with a neutral charge and then the monomers will actually link together with the positive charge. So we can change this distribution of charge. But let's just move forward here. Um, this was actually the demonstration. This reaction here where we took um, a polyadenine, this is DNA, and we put the thymidine monomer that was modified in the five prime and three prime position. This was actually the first demonstration of a, of a clean, non-enzymatic, template-directed polymerization that gave a chain-link specific product. 
Okay, so this is the first time this has ever been done outside of a cell. Okay, so using template directed polymerization. Now, some interesting features about this. One of the things that, that we have noted and that we need to do a lot more research on is understanding the kinetics of this reaction, um, how this reaction actually proceeds. It actually grows in a very different model than DNA. DNA is a length growth polymerization. It adds one piece to the end of the chain and continues to grow. What we actually see is a step growth polymerization where we go from monomers to dimers, which you can see here. So monomer to dimer. So all of this has moved to dimer in six hours. After 24 hours, most of the dimer has now become tetramers. And then after 48 hours, most of the tetramers have now become octamers. And after about, I think it's about 60 hours, this goes to about 91% completion. It's still a little slow. One of the other things that we're working on is trying to speed this up. Um, once we get back to doing some of this polymerization. But um, this kinetic growth is actually going to be something that we need to understand much better in order to understand how we can manipulate this system. And so one of the future works that we have is to understand this kinetics um, and how the kinetics change as these chains get longer and longer and longer. Um, so the last thing that I want to tell you about before I pass this over to Caitlin is that we actually have a little bit of an understanding, a very little bit of an understanding, about some of the selectivity of this. What we know is that if we put these dimers in here with a very short template, um, if all the base pairs are correctly matched and everything is anti-parallel, this reaction happens very cleanly. All of these dimers, you can see all the dimer is gone and we have made the tetramer product. But in the two situations down here, the first one being we have a base pair mismatch, the reaction does not go. As long as we can let it sit there, if there's one base pair mismatch, this is where the thermodynamics come in. That base pairing is wrong, therefore it falls apart, and this reaction won't happen. And so we just stay as the dimer. And the other thing is that if we force it, we try to force it to form in a parallel fashion. So DNA forms in an anti-parallel fashion naturally. If we try to force it to actually form in a parallel fashion, we also do not get any reaction, which is hopefully lending us or leading us down the road that hopefully what we're actually seeing is that this product, even though it has a different backbone, we're hoping that it actually has some of the same structural features that, not, that natural DNA has. So, as I said, we've been working on these, and where are we at right now? So, on the thymidine monomer, Sarah Anderson has actually been working on this for quite some time, and we'll hopefully finish the thymidine monomer so we can get back to doing some of these polymerization studies. Hopefully, she'll finish that this spring. Um, Luke Rustad will pick up the synthesis of the cytosine monomer this spring as well. And then I'm going to turn this over and let Caitlin t describe to you where we're at on the uh, adenosine polymerization or synthesis. So, here you go, Caitlin. Okay, hi, I'm Caitlin. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the research that I did this summer. So, this is the overall goal of the project that I was working on. Um, on the left is the adenosine monomer in its natural state, just the DNA base. And um, on the right is the modified monomer that we're hoping to make. And as you can see, they don't look very different. The changes are that in the five prime hydroxyl position, we're changing it to an amine group. And in the three prime hydroxyl position, we're changing it to an aldehyde. Um, and this looks, while it looks fairly simple, we actually have to go through a lot of different chemical reactions because of all the other functional groups on the molecule. So we have to protect and deprotect certain parts of it so that we can get the chemistry to happen in exactly the places we want it to. So to show you what that looks like, this is the thymidine monomer synthesis pathway um, that other researchers, re researchers have worked on before I ever started on it. Um, this is what Sarah Anderson has been doing. And it works really well with thymidine. There are eight steps, and um, it works quite well. However, when we tried to do the same synthetic pathway with adenosine, we ran into problems with the last step. Um, there's a red box around it right there because it's under the reaction is under acidic conditions and essentially it degrades the molecule that we're working with. Um, the purine detaches from the sugar base and we lose our product. So to deal with that problem, a new pathway was proposed. And this one's a little more difficult 
because it has a couple extra steps. This one's actually 11 steps long. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about the main ideas behind it, the first few reactions, we're protecting the left side of the molecule by adding this big protecting group right here. And uh, once we have those parts of the molecule locked down, we can add protecting groups on some of the other functional areas on the right side of the molecule. Once those are covered up, we take off the protecting group on the left side so that we can start to do the chemistry where we want to do it and only in those places. Um, then in the next step, we add this thiocarbonyl dimidazole, and that's eventually going to be turned into uh, the aldehyde that we want in the final product. And then later, a few steps, we add an azide ion that will eventually uncover our amine group in the final product. Um, and then in the very last step, we remove all the other protecting groups so that we have only the final product we want with no protecting groups left on it. Um, I finished the first five steps of the synthesis. Those are shown in solid lines with my percent yields behind the reaction. And then the dashed lines represent reactions that have yet to be completed. So some of the experimental techniques. Uh, a lot of what I did this summer was learning new techniques in the lab. I had taken organic chemistry and general chemistry, and I learned some of the basic techniques that we use in lab, but I still had a lot, a lot to learn. One of the most important things was learning how to perform reactions under inert conditions. This is just a picture of that setup. There is a glass bulb with the reaction mixture in it. And then there's a needle with a hose attached to it that has a light flow of nitrogen gas going into it that um, is inert. And that just makes sure that there's very little water molecules or oxygen in the reaction that could be interfering with it. Another technique we use is high vacuum evaporation, which is actually the same setup, but instead of applying nitrogen gas, you're actually pulling a vacuum on the glass bulb. And that facilitates the evaporation and gets rid of water molecules and other solvents in your mixture. Um, this is a very important technique that we used a lot. It was not my favorite thing to do because it takes a long time. Um, but it's a way of purifying the compound that we want from some of the unreacted reactants. This is column chromatography. And what it is, it's just a glass column. And it has a silica resin in it that's a stationary phase. And what you do is you pour your reaction mixture in the top, and then you run solvent through it. And you collect solvent in tiny test tubes, and then you save only the test tubes that have the product that you want. And so it's a way of separating the product you want from any other impurities that are present. Um, I also did a lot of thin layer chromatography, or TLC, which is a way of monitoring what types of products you have in um, a reaction mixture, because it also separates compounds based on their polarity. I also use the rotavap a lot. There's a picture of this. Um, this is right in our lab. And it's basically just a way to speed up the evaporation process. Um, the glass bulb attaches right here. And it sits in a temperature bath that warms it up a little bit, and then it pulls a vacuum on it. So it just evaporates your solvents off really quickly and makes research go a lot faster. And finally, NMR. This is a picture of a really nice NMR um, that we would like to someday have. <laughs> but, um, not yet. We don't have one. So we actually have to go to the University of Minnesota to use an NMR. This is not their NMR, but it's one similar, but not this nice. Um, what the NMR is, we put our sample in there, and it applies a magnet to the sample, and it gives off a spectral, like a spectrum that allows us to deduce the structure of the molecule. It tells us something about the chemical environment of the different protons. So this is actually the spectrum that I got for the A1 product. Um, I showed the reaction up on the top. This is the adenosine monomer. Um, the reaction that I ran, and then this is the A1 product that we hoped to get. So we knew what the spectrum looks like for the adenosine monomer, 
So when we ran an NMR and got this spectrum, we compared the two. And what we were looking for was this big peak right at one. And we did indeed get that, and that is showing that we added this big protecting group on the left. That peak is due to all the protons on this large protecting group that are circled. So we were happy to see that peak, and we moved on with the reaction pathway. This is the spectrum for A2, showing the reaction from A1 to A2. And what we were looking for, the new thing we were looking for in this graph, is the presence of these little groups of peaks right around three, as well as this group of peaks just below one. And when we saw those, we knew that it was very likely that we had added these protecting groups on the right side of the molecule. Um, and then we moved on to the next step. This is actually the reaction from A3 to A4. And what we were looking for here, well actually first, if you'll notice right around one, right at one, that peak is missing. And if we go back, there's a big peak right above one. Um, and then when we go to the next reaction, that peak is gone, showing that we removed that protecting group on the left. So just pointing that out first, we also are looking for a peak below one and right at zero, showing that we added this new protecting group on the five prime uh, carbon. This is the last step of the synthetic pathway that I completed. It's A4 to A5. And the big thing we're looking for here is the addition of peaks between 7 and 8. And I'll go back to the spectrum of A4. If you'll look between 7 and 8, there's just one peak. And if we go to A5, there's many more peaks there. And those show that we added the, um, the aromatic ring on the 3 prime carbon. So we were glad to see those because it's likely that we did indeed add this group. So some of our future goals for the product. Um, first, it would be to finish the synthesis of the adenosine monomer. We're approximately halfway through that pathway. And then to optimize the synthetic pathway. As we were going through the first five steps, there were multiple times where we would change the temperature of a reaction or change the solvent that we were using, maybe add an acid wash, just little changes to optimize our yield. So we'd want to continue to do that to get the uh, best reaction conditions to increase our yield and purity. Um, next, we would want to do some polymerization studies with homo template and hetero template strands. And then researchers in the future will want to examine the kinetics and the fidelity of the templated polymerization the affinity of the amine nucleoside strands for DNA, and perhaps the structure of the DNA AMP complex. And then at this time, we would like to acknowledge many people at Bethel University, Emory University, and the University of Minnesota. And we'd be happy to take any questions. So that's it. <laughs> that's what we did this summer. So it would take any questions if you have. question for you in terms of the process of actually doing research over the summer. What do you what do you think are some of the things that you learned that were most surprising to you about doing this kind of research? Um, the question was asked what were some of the things that I learned while doing research this summer. Um, I was surprised how tedious it is. It doesn't when we present it it doesn't look like it would be that hard to do. Um, it seems kind of cookbook, like, oh, we have the reaction conditions, you just do it. But it doesn't work that way most of the time. <laughs> so just kind of learning that and then learning to persevere through that and facing disappointment multiple days in a row, like your product didn't work or your product burned or something like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that was one of the things I learned, just I understand the world of research a little bit more. Any other questions? And what's ahead for you, professionally? 
what's ahead for me professionally? Well, I applied to medical school and I had three interviews this year, but I have not heard back yet whether I'm accepted or waitlisted or rejected. So hopefully medical school. Any other questions? Um, potential, so the question is, are there any specific or uh, potential targets for this, this idea, some disease states that we could go after? Um, I mean, I think you could think about um, any disease state that has a, um, the production of a protein as part of its mechanism, okay? Um, I think you could think about, um, and, and well, the one caveat of that, and also has a, a specific target that you could go after that's, that's not just going to kill everything, right? I mean, so, um, so you could think, um, say something like HIV that has um, a, a very heavy protein output, okay? So it takes over the cell and it's producing all kinds of protein outputs in order to make more viruses, right? But those protein outputs are unique to the HIV virus. So um, you could potentially target something along those lines. What would be more difficult would be to target something, let's say like cancer, where the, the cell is really producing native enzymes just in uh, maybe the wrong concentrations or it's, it's doing it too rapidly. But they're native enzymes. So if you're targeting those, are you shutting them off somewhere else in the body as well? So something like a cancer cell would be a little bit more difficult, um, but not, it, it's, it's possible. But anything, I think basically any disease state that you could think of where, where there is some type of a, a, a protein output that is part of that um, that disease state, you, you could potentially target um, using using methodology like this. And this is something um, not just that we're we're trying to look at, but any anybody working in this RNA interference um, kind of an area. This, this is what they're thinking about. Is there is there a disease state that has a protein output that we could stop and control? So so those, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess just to clarify, so you said, is this a unique approach as far as using a synthetic template and it, so is, is it nobody else is really trying to do this or are there different ways or there are there are different ways so there there is a class called uh, PNAs which are protein nucleic acids there are a whole other class called morpholinos that have a different uh, ring structure in them um, there are a lot of people that are working in the area of um, alternate backbones right trying to figure out and what can we use those for the interesting thing about those is none of those are able to utilize a template-directed model where you could say if, let's say, you had a disease state that we were going after, we could take that DNA, we could isolate exactly what we're looking for, and use that as a template to design our target. Okay, Everything else, all these other methodologies require doing this, this uh, production basically in a test tube. You have to make it one step at a time through a, through a chemical synthesis. Mm -hmm. Whereas this, hopefully what we can do is we can just have a pool of monomers and for any target that comes in, we can use this as a template and allow this templating process to make these products quickly. So kind of pull it from a, nat a natural DNA, from right. so like an individual patient pull exactly. out their DNA, use that template and then synthesize something. Okay. Exactly. Because the thing is, is that in, in all of these cases, we're using native DNA as the template that we're working with. Okay. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Anything else? Well, again, on behalf of Caitlin and I, just thank you for coming out and listening. And uh, if you have any other questions afterward, we'll be glad to answer. So thanks a lot. Thank you.